So welcome back for uh, for uh, the really the last time now to uh, to the 8-bit CPU and to uh, the last video in this series. Um, and so today we're uh, not going to be talking much about about hardware. Uh, we'll actually start programming our uh, CPU. And so uh, I, I want to try and convert this C program here, uh, which is going to calculate prime numbers, all prime numbers uh, between zero and 255. Um, and so uh, this C program calculates them uh, uh, on my on my MacBook here, and so I can run that program. And uh, there should be a link showing in the video now uh, where I have a small explanation of, of how I put this program together. Uh, but so in this episode, we'll be we'll be manually compiling this uh, C program into assembly language for our uh, homemade CPU, and then we'll try and run it uh, on the machine. All right, let's uh, start an assembly line here. Put it over there so we can uh, have our C code here at the same time. So we have uh, one, two, three, four, five functions here. Uh, although this is is it's, well, this is not really going to be a function on our computer. That's just going to be uh, moving some value into the A register. So uh, so that won't really become a function. But uh, we'll, we'll make functions out of these other four pieces of code. So that's uh, four functions, uh, which we'll have in our code. And we have uh, two global variables. And uh, so, uh, you know, if this were, uh, say, uh, Intel assembly or, or any assembly for a, for a classical uh, CPU, then, then we'd probably write something like uh, data section. And then we'd write, uh, we'd write some label, which would be prime count. And we'd say, uh, okay, I want you to reserve uh, a byte for that, and, and the initial value will be zero. Uh, that, that's what you would do classically in, in, in assembly. Uh, but of course, uh, on our computer, uh, that, that would insert this uh, byte of zero uh, inside the program. And of course, uh, that's not the way our CPU works, because, because we have separated program and data memory. And so these uh, variables here, this prime count and these primes, they will actually be in data memory. They won't be in uh, the program memory. And so I can't do whatever the equivalent is in, in my assembly language of that. Um, I need to simply uh, assume some address and, and, and uh, allocate an address. So in, in fact, I, I sort of have to play linker uh, at the same time and find some address in data memory for, for these two variables. Now, uh, th all that's going into data memory are the global variables in the stack, and so we want the stack to grow from, from the top of uh, memory, so from address 255, and we'll want our, uh, our global data to start uh, to address zero. There's, there's no reason to, to use any other address. So the way we're gonna do it on, on our computer is we'll simply define uh, constants uh, to be equal to, to the addresses of, of these variables. And so uh, the, the prime count, that, that'll be a single byte, uh, we can we can put that at address zero, and so we won't be using that. And uh, I'll simply equate another constant, uh, call it primes, and, and, and we'll equate that to one. So uh, so in our memory at, a, at at address zero, we'll have this uh, this length of the array, and the array itself will uh, start at address one. And so that's how we'll be doing it in our program. And uh, all right, then we can uh, start uh, implementing our functions in, in assembly here. So we can start with the calc remained. And then now uh, we're, of course, uh, writing assembler here for, for some C code from absolutely from scratch. And uh, so we have nothing here. This, this is a uh, pure bare bones. We don't even have an operating system. We, we don't have initialized variables. We have uh, absolutely nothing. And uh, so there, there are a few conventions that, that we're, we're gonna need to adhere to in order not to get lost in, in our translation. And, and that's typically what a compiler would do. And, and so compilers use uh, what they call calling conventions, which uh, basically define uh, exactly what you're going to do uh, when you receive such, a, uh, such a, a function definition and when such a function is called, such as here. Uh, because there, there are a number of options. How are you going to pass these parameters uh, to, to the function that's being called? And this function also returns a result back. So. Uh, so how, how are we gonna send that result uh, from this piece of code back, back to that piece of code? And uh, so we need to define calling conventions for, uh, for our CPU, in, in essentially. And uh, I wanna keep things simple uh, for, for as far as we can. So uh, um, these are all 8-bit uh, unsigned values. Uh, so 
I think we'll just stick to registers for now. And, uh, and if, if we write the code for this, so, so we'll be subtracting some value from some other value uh, in a loop. And, and so the, the, the core code of that uh, routine is going to be something like subtract. Uh, I don't know, let's put the dividend in the D register. And then uh, because we'll, we'll be continually subtracting and then writing the result back in the D register, which is in fact exactly what that does, uh, it makes sense to put the divisor in the B register because uh, remember, uh, our ALU can only, has to have at least uh, one operand equal to the B register. And so uh, if we use that convention, well, we, we could simply say, uh, we'll write a comment here so, so we know what's happening. We could simply say that, uh, uh, that this function expects uh, the D register to be equal to a dividend uh, and the, the, the B register to be equal to divisor. And so we're going to have to take care of, of making sure that those are the values in those registers uh, when we call this function. So that's uh, something we'll be doing when we implement our is prime function. And uh, at the same time, this function is, is going to return some result. And, you know, if we want to keep it really simple, we'll, we'll have the result here in uh, dividend. And I just noticed that uh, uh, we need to return dividend. So that's uh, very weird that, that the program actually functioned. All right. So um, uh, the return is, is, is in fact ready. If, if we say that uh, we return uh, the result of the function in, in, uh, in the D register, well, then that basically is our function and we just need to build a loop around it. So uh, let's say that is the return value. All right. Um, now, how are we gonna how are we gonna go about this loop? Well, we need to compare. So we need to compare, uh, uh, in this case, the uh, the and the B register. And uh, so, if uh, the the dividend is larger than or equal to the divisor, so if this uh, left operand is larger than the right operand, that means uh, so a compare is a subtraction. That means the result of this subtraction is equal or larger to zero. And because it is a subtraction, that means the carry will be set, remember, on, on our uh, CPU. Uh, then we should, you know, uh, actually do this, uh, do this uh, subtraction. So we'll, we'll, we'll make a local label uh, for this code. And uh, so in that case, we should jump to this uh, local label. Because if, it, if, if we don't have a carry, that means a borrow occurred, which means that dividend was smaller than divisor. Well, then we actually need to exit this function. So if that's the case, we should uh, simply return. And uh, so as it turns out, that, that is the code for our, oh, for our uh, calculate a remainder. I'm just going to format it a bit nicer here. And uh, so there we are. First function done. Three more left to go. Um, so that is the calc remainder, which returns. Uh, and it returns an unsigned int, and uh, we can just take that signature actually. Like that. There we go. And so that, that fully documents the calling convention that, that we'll be using for that function. All right, let's get on to the next one. So the next one is, uh, is prime. And uh, it might seem a bit weird at first, but I'm, I'm going to put my functions in, in my assembly file in the reverse order. And the result of that is going to be that be because in the, the way C works, uh, uh, you need to def declare functions before you can actually call them. And so uh, uh, in a C program, you're always jumping backwards. And uh, because that's, that's a little bit counterintuitive, I'll be ordering the functions in the opposite way in my assembly file so, so that we'll always be calling forwards because uh, now We'll be implementing this is prime function, and the is prime function is, is actually going to call the, the calc remained function. So, all right, let's uh, start doing that. Uh, let's first quickly copy over the, the signature of the function here. This is a, this is just documentation, but it but it it makes our code uh, more readable. If uh, anyone later comes uh, comes across this assembly and, and wants to understand uh, what it's actually doing. So uh, how are we going to uh, do that? Well, uh, we're, once again, we're, we're uh, expecting uh, input parameters and we're sending out some outputs. Uh, we can start with the same convention that we had up there and, and we'll see how it goes. So uh, let's say we expect the candidate uh, 
a value on the RD register on the input, and then the, we'll be uh, returning the, uh, the return value on, also on the D register. Right. So let's see. Uh, let's see how we how we do with that. So we have our is prime, and what are we going to do? So the, what we have in the is prime is a, is a is a big for loop. So a for, uh, you know, the way we're going to do that in assembly is probably something we'll, we'll have some label up here, which will be the top of our for loop, and then we'll have some code, and, and then down the bottom here we'll, we'll have a we'll have a jump back to the beginning. That's uh, very likely. So uh, of course we can't use that label anymore. So we'll, we'll use two. <clears throat> and so, uh, what what are the conditions that we need to take care of? So uh, this uh, insi unsigned int prime index uh, equal to zero, uh, we're, that needs to be outside of our for loop, of course, because it, we, we do that only once. And so, so we'll, we'll be doing that here. And so we need to decide where are we going to put this uh, this 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 value, this uh, prime index. And of course, it's a counter, uh, and we'll be using that counter mainly uh, to calculate. Uh, indices inside this array and so if you think about how how we're gonna do that uh, in, in in assembly uh, well what we're gonna need to do is we, we have the the start address of primes so in, in in essence we have the address of primes index 0 and so to find the address of, of some other element in the array where in fact we're gonna add primes and prime index together and so a prime index will be an operand for uh, an add instruction on, on several occasions. So in a way, it makes sense to, to try and put that in the B register. So um, uh, let's let's do that. So let's uh, uh, set the uh, D register, the, the B register initially to zero. That's uh, that's this here. And um, we, we can copy that line as a comment just to, to make sure our code is uh, understandable. And then when we start the for loop, uh, the first thing we're going to want to do is, is to check these conditions. Uh, because if these conditions are, if any of these is false, then we should break out of the for loop and, and return true. So uh, let's let's start checking them. So the first condition is, is pretty easy. Prime index is smaller than prime count. Uh, or in other words, prime count is larger than or equal to prime index. Uh, no, sorry, prime count is a larger than prime index, so not a prime index larger than or equal to prime count. And the reason we want to transform this into something which is larger than or equal is because that's what our compare instruction uh, does. So if I compare uh, some operand with some other operand, uh, then I'll be subtracting the two values. And so uh, if the first operand is larger than or equal to the second operand, then the carry will be set, and otherwise uh, it will not be set. And so it's a good idea to, to try and express that uh, in terms of larger than or equal. And so this is exactly the opposite of a prime index larger than or equal to prime count. And so prime index is in the B register, because uh, that's where we put it. And uh, prime and prime count is is this value here uh, in, in, in RAM. So uh, before we do that, we actually need to go and read it out. So we, we, we're going to need a load instruction. So we can uh, load that into uh, RC, for example. We can load the value of uh, prime count. And so prime count is going to be located at, at this address. And that's the address of, of the variable prime count. So we can, we can just uh, insert that as an immediate operand uh, into our load instruction. So in, in essence, that is uh, RC equals prime count. That's, that's what that does. And then we're going to be comparing uh, uh, prime index with the prime count, like that. And uh, if so, we can we can check on carry. That's the the, the easiest way to, to check for a larger or smaller after a comparison uh, for of unsigned uh, values. And uh, so in this case, if the carry is set, uh, what that means is that no borrow occurred. So this compare instruction didn't borrow. So that means that uh, R B is small is greater or equal to R C. And so that means that prime index is greater or equal to prime count. Uh, so it's exactly the opposite of this condition. So if the carry is true, that means we should exit our loop. So uh, for the moment, let's let's just imagine we have some uh, some uh, some symbol here return true. So uh, uh, beyond our for loop, just for our brains, let's have some 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 symbol here which says return true. So 
uh, naively, what, what could we say? We could say that we want into the D register, we want to set a 1, because we're returning true, uh, and then we return the function. Something like that. Uh, just so we understand what's happening. Uh, so that's uh, if prime uh, index is greater than or equal to prime count. All right, that's uh, pretty good so far. So uh, if that's not the case, uh, then we'll end up here. And so we can check the second condition. Since they're ands, uh, we, can, we can check them uh, uh, sequentially. That, that's how an and works. So for an and to be true, both conditions need to satisfy. So the next condition involves uh, uh, this uh, uh, array expression. So we, we need to get some value out of an array. And so I've, as we've said, uh, we're going to need to add primes and a prime index together. And of course, primes uh, is a value in, in is, is, is this constant here, is, is, the ad is an address somewhere in data memory. So uh, we'll start by uh, setting uh, that particular address uh, in, in some register. So uh, we don't need the C anymore. We, we use that quickly here to, to get prime count. But, uh, but in this expression, we don't need prime count anymore. So, so we can use it again. So we'll set uh, it to the address this time of primes. And then, of course, that, that means that RC currently is pointing at, at, at the, the zero, the first element in, in primes, uh, element at index zero. But we want the element at index uh, prime index. And the prime index, we, we've been uh, storing in the B register. So we want to add the B register to that. And now, uh, RC contains the address of this expression. And then so we can go and load that expression into some other register. And, uh, and here we, we might run into a little bit of trouble because we're, we're running out of registers. Um, we might like to load it in the D register, something like that. Uh, but of course, we can't yet because the D register uh, contains this uh, input value, which, uh, which we don't want to lose. So there's an easy way around that. Let's uh, just put it on the stack. So we push the D register away. And so we can, we can, we can get it back again uh, after we've, we've done with, with checking this condition. And then we can uh, check this condition very quickly. Um, OK, so uh, we can then load uh, our primes, prime index into the D register. Uh, and now we also need to, uh, we need to uh, compare that against the, the value 16. And uh, so now we have another problem. Because uh, we're, we're going to be comparing, and one of the operands needs to be the B register. And so to do that, we're also going to need to write something else into the B register. But the B register contains this, this index here. And, and so we're, we're going to want to save that as well. So uh, let's push the B register as well. And so at this point, the stack actually contains, uh, you know, whatever was there before, followed by the D register, which was in fact candidate. Candidate. Uh, and followed by the B register, which is a prime index. And so to make sure we don't lose track of things, let's write in the comment here what we are expecting at this point. So now we can uh, uh, load this uh, 16 into the B register. So, uh, all right, B is equal to 16. And now we want to compare. So uh, in, in which order are we going to compare? So once again, it's useful to transform that into a into a larger than or equals. Uh, and so we could say that that is not primes, prime index larger than or equals to 16. And primes, prime index, that's uh, the D register. We've just calculated that. And so if we can compare that to the B register, then if that is larger or equals, uh, then we'll get a carry because then this subtraction will result in a positive or a zero value. So we can say jump carry uh, to the same destination, so uh, return true. Except we have a little problem if we do that. And I'll, I'll uh, explain what that is. Uh, we've just pushed two values on the stack, which we intend to retrieve later because, because we're going to need them in, in the rest of our loop. Um, and so if I uh, simply jump over here uh, and then put some value in D in return, then uh, that return is obviously uh, that, that's going to cause all kinds of problems because the ret it, in fact this part of the stack will contain the return address but i've just pushed two values on there 
And so I can't simply uh, return like that. Uh, I need to do something else. And so, as it turns out, um, this is a, not a very useful way of doing things. Um, it would be more useful if we, if we could turn it around. So if we could, um, uh, if, if I say uh, compare B to D, then what will happen is, uh, in fact, this expression will be true um, if 16 is larger than or equal to the D register. Um, uh, and so then we'll, we'll have a carry. And so what, I, what I'm trying to achieve is, is that I want to continue, I want to, I want to consider that I'm going to execute the body of this for loop uh, if I have a carry, if, if this uh, subtraction results in something positive. And so uh, the way we have it now, that's going to happen if uh, 16 is larger than or equal to um, the D register, which is our uh, prime's prime index. And so that's not quite true. We need it to be, we need 16 to be larger, not larger or equals. But a 16 larger or equals is the same, uh, 16, sorry, larger than some value is the same as 15 larger or equals. So, so we'll just put 15 in our D register. And that means that uh, if, if we don't have a carry, then uh, this was negative, meaning we are in fact, uh, the, the, this, this condition is not satisfied. And so then we can simply pop back these two values, which we put on the stack. It doesn't really matter into which register. Um, I'll just do it in the, in the same registers that they came from. Uh, the reason here is, is in fact, we, we don't need to do that because we don't need to save them. All we need to do is to increase the stack pointer twice. Because we're not interested in these values anymore, or we're going to exit the function, but we do need to make sure that, that our stack pointer, that, that our arithmetic is, is correct. Uh, but we can't do that, because stack pointer is not um, uh, a general purpose register, and uh, our ALU only accepts uh, general purpose registers. So, so we need to pop into some dummy register. That, that's the only way we can increase the stack register. And uh, so we'll do that. And, uh, and then we can uh, jump to return true. All right. Now I've uh, just realized another problem with this code. Um, we're uh, loading here from an address which is located in the C register. And uh, when we talked about the microcode, if you remember, I, I assigned uh, the C register the special meaning that uh, load instructions based on it will load from program memory. And of course, that's not what we want because we're, we're trying to access our, our array here of prime numbers, which is in data memory. So we can't use the C register for this. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the roles of the C and the D register. So we'll be calculating the address in the D register uh, and, and loading the value into the C register. But of course, that means that um, we need to save our D register before we use it, which is, which is now up here. And so we'll uh, push the D register uh, at this point in the code. And so then we can uh, just, uh, just for our brains here, write some comments so we know what's going on with the can with the stack so that at this point contains only the candidate and then we'll be loading the uh, the C register will we'll then contain this uh, this primes uh, at index prime index so we can load into the C register that that doesn't uh, that's no problem uh, the problem is uh, when we use it as the address register so unless we're accessing program memory we, we can't use the C register for in, in that role but the D register is fine um, and so th uh, what that means, of course, is that the, the, the real value that we're interested in is in the C register. And so after this point, we don't need the D register anymore. So we can put the candidate value back. So uh, as it turns out, that's actually better code. And so now the stack is, uh, is, 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 is basically uh, the same as, as when we entered the function. So, so that's good. And then at this point, of course, we're pushing the B register because now we're going to override the B register. But so uh, the candidate is no longer on the stack. So what we have here is the prime index. Candidate is now located in the D register. We can, we can write that here. In fact, is candidate. Very good. So uh, the rest here is all the same. And uh, so this, this uh, stays the same. Of course, now we're comparing with the C register because the C register is what contains prime's prime index. Um, and uh, this can, we can get rid of this because we've already popped the D register over there. So there's only one value in the stack, uh, but we still need to get rid of that B in the case that, that we're uh, exiting at this point. 
Uh, but if we don't, then uh, we'll continue and we'll, we'll write the contents of our loop uh, here. And so what do we want to do here? Well, we want to call the calc remain function. So uh, we, we, we will write my call instruction here. And so calc remains. I, I can't do that. If you remember in our discussion of the microcode, how we implemented the call instruction, I can't put the address as an immediate operand to the call instruction. I, in fact, have to put it in the C register. And then I need to call based on the C register. You know, the, the limited architecture, the limited the simplicity, let's say, of, of the hardware is the reason why we have to program that way. Uh, and then again, of course, we're going to have some problems because our C register uh, at this point contains a primes prime index. And that's exactly one of the arguments to the function. So, so we, it would be a, a shame to lose that. But as it turns out, uh, this function expects uh, that particular argument in the B register. So if we just do that before we clobber the C register with, with some other value, then uh, we should be fine. And so the only other thing left to do is to make sure that candidate is in the D register, because that's what this function expects. Uh, expects this uh, dividend, which is the first argument of the function, to be in the D register. Um, and it already is, because uh, when we popped it off the stack here, uh, that's where it went, went into the D register. So that's great. We've actually got our arguments uh, set up for calc rename, and uh, we can we can uh, we're basically done here. Then of course uh, this function will execute. Um, it actually will overwrite the D register with its return value, and the return value will be the remainder of the division. But uh, since we're in a tight loop here, uh, we, we want to keep that value candidate. And, and in our C code, we're not overwriting candidate. It's passed by value. And so uh, that, that candidate should stay fixed. So what we need to do is, uh, in fact, we do need to save it before we call our calculator remained. Because it, calculator remained, calculate remainder, will overwrite the D register. And so we'll, we'll save a copy of that. And so uh, in this case, we need to remember that the B is also st uh, on the stack store, contains the uh, prime index variable, and so we also have candidate on the stack now. But all right, then we call, and that, that was uh, the end of the for loop, if you remember. Uh, then we call, um, and we, of course, uh, are interested in the result of that. So if the result of this remainder should equal zero, and here is a, a good case for our, our test instruction. So the, the result will be in the D register. That's what calc remain does. It puts its result in the D register. So we need to test whether the D register is zero. So simple enough. And uh, so if it's a zero, uh, in the case that it's zero, we should uh, jump to uh, return false. Okay. Now, um, uh, let's uh, write return false here. So naively, what we do we need to do? We need to set the D register to zero because this function should return one or zero. It's uh, returning a boolean, um, and then we should return. But of course, uh, when we do that, uh, w once again, our, our stack is is not the way it's uh, it ought to be when we're returning. And so we need to do some, some more work here. Uh, in fact, we need to pop two values off the stack before we can do that. And uh, so we're, 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 you know, we use the registers that we've already using. So candidate went into the D register, and the prime index went into the B register. And so now, so after that instruction, the stack we will have popped off the candidate, but the prime index will still be there. And here, our stack will be restored to the state when we entered the function. And so at this point, we can return safely. But if this is not zero, so if the result of that, uh, sorry, if the result of that calculate remainder is uh, not zero, is anything else, then uh, we then nothing happens. We simply continue and we, we, we come to the end of our for loop. And so, in fact, we need to uh, increment prime index by one. And so that's the code that should come between here and, and this channel. And so uh, a prime index is, uh, is uh, on the stack. 
And so first of all, we, we can uh, restore a candidate. And uh, you might be wondering, uh, I'm actually doing the same thing uh, on, on both sides of this uh, jump zero. So uh, can't I put this uh, proc rd up here and then jump zero um, uh, no matter what? And the answer is no, I can't because this pop instruction also involves the ALU and it will clobber the flags. And so uh, at this point, this zero flag will reflect this pop operation and not the test operation. And so unfortunately, um, I don't have a save flags uh, or push flags instruction like some processors have and so I have to uh, execute a conditional instruction immediately as soon as the flags are ready that's that's the only way and so on my CPU unfortunately I, I need to uh, duplicate this code uh, for that reason so so this will not work so all right um, after we do that then uh, our stack once again we have lost one value so we will be left with the prime index and in fact, D will contain the candidate. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit unfortunate. I'm going to write it that way. There we go. All right. Um, and then uh, there's one more value on the stack, uh, um, in fact, which we need to manipulate now because we are going to uh, increase prime index. So uh, we're going to put that back into the B register. And so then our stack, once again, will be in its uh, initial condition. And uh, we need to increase the B register. That's, uh, that's what we do here. So we're in, in, a, in a sense, we're, we're increasing prime index. So uh, the result of that is that B, once again, contains prime index. And uh, this instruction is uh, simply an increase, in, uh, an increment in the prime index. And uh, that's the end of the for loop. So we go back to uh, uh, back up the top here. And so we'll once again uh, drop straight into these conditions and it will evaluate them once again uh, with the, the new value of the prime index. And uh, so uh, that ought to be our uh, is prime function. Now, uh, something else that this function does besides uh, uh, expecting a candidate and, and returning a return value, uh, you'll see we've pretty much used uh, all of the other registers, in particular B and C. And so uh, the calling function uh, might be interested to know that uh, uh, he should save uh, B and C as well if, if he wants to use this function. So uh, it's always good in the, in the definition of your function uh, to uh, explicitly state that the B and the C register will be clobbered by uh, this function. It doesn't touch A, so uh, whatever's in A will remain there. And uh, we do that deliberately because otherwise we would, uh, of course, have the value show up on the digital display and, and we really only want prime numbers showing up in there. Uh, and this uh, calc remainder function doesn't actually clobber any of the other registers. So uh, if there's some value in C, uh, the calculate remainder function will, will not affect that. Uh, and as it turns out, the, the, the value which is in C at this point is, is in fact the address of the function. So uh, we clobbered it by calling it, but, uh, but that's not something that the function does. All right, let's quickly do some, uh, some cleanup of the function. So can my uh, assembler doesn't uh, allow labels on empty lines. I should fix that someday, but I haven't yet. Um, all right, uh, it does in fact allow empty lines, but uh, not necessary. Uh, we might want to uh, have a comment here to say what we're doing. So the C register and all, all of this here, uh, the purpose of that is to calculate this uh, primes of uh, this prime index element inside the primes array. And that makes that a bit clearer. Right. Now the next function is uh, so show prime. We said we we, we won't really write an, an explicit function for that because it's uh, simply uh, moving this value into the A register. So we're, whenever we call that function, we'll simply move a value into the A register. So the next function is this uh, find primes. So let's uh, write some assembly for that. And so once again, we'll, we'll be writing that uh, over the top of the existing functions so that in, in assembly we'll be calling downwards and not in, as opposed to C, which is calling upwards. 
Uh, all right, so here's the function signature. Oh, let me get that to get this. There we go. So uh, that has no arguments, which is very easy. And so the only thing it might do is uh, it, it doesn't expect to return anything, but of course it might clobber some uh, registers. And of course we'll only know that once we finish uh, writing the function. So uh, let's start writing it. Find primes. Uh, what do we need to do? So uh, once again, we have a for loop. And so in this case, we're uh, looping across uh, a whole series of candidate prime numbers. And the calling is prime for each one and, and, and uh, figuring out if uh, it's a prime number. So uh, we'll uh, assign this uh, candidate value in, into some register. And since we'll be uh, uh, passing it into the uh, is prime function in the D register, uh, I think the D register is probably a good place to, uh, to store this uh, local variable. So let's start with the start using the D register. So uh, right, the initial value is three. So uh, we're saying basically the D register is can the date is three. That's what that does. And then we'll have the, the actual for loop. And so a for loop, uh, as we know, it's, it's basically it's a label at the top of the loop. And then somewhere down the bottom, we'll, we'll just jump back to it. Um, and so uh, what we'll be doing at the top of the loop is uh, evaluating the condition. And so the condition in this case is candidate smaller than 256. Um, and because of the, what 256 represents, it, in, in fact, it's an overflow. So. Uh, um, in essence, what I want to do is, is if some operation carries, uh, then I want to exit the loop. Uh, so in that case, I, I want to exit the loop. I want to get out of here. So uh, in, in fact, I want to return, but I can't jump carry return. So I need some label, which simply contains a return instruction. And so uh, this is this is what I really want to do. Uh, but of course, we have no uh, ALU operation in front here. So, so this carry flag will, will, will actually never be set. Um, but uh, if we remember that uh, just before this jump here, uh, what we're actually doing is we're adding two to the candidate. So uh, how do we add two? Well, we could either increase twice. That's uh, one possibility. Um, so our candidates in, in the D register. So we could do that. Uh, but of course, uh, if we do that, uh, and, and supposing our value is uh, 255, which it could be, uh, then of course it will end up as 257. And so this first increase will set the carry, but then the D register will in fact be zero. And the second increase will increase it to one, but will have lost the carry. Uh, and so that's not a good idea uh, in this particular case where we're actually testing for, uh, for an overflow. And so we'll, we're going to have to do the addition of two in, in one go. So uh, we need to put two in the, in the D register and then add uh, that two to to our local variable, to candidate. So in, in essence, what we're doing here is we're saying uh, candidate plus equals two. And then our carry will be set correctly. So that's a single addition operation. And so if that overflows, and if, a, if a carry occurs, then after this jump, we'll detect it. And this jump is purely a move operation. It doesn't involve the uh, ALU. Uh, and so the flags will not be affected by it. And so in this case, we, we can actually uh, wait for a while and, and, and use the fact that uh, we're jumping back over here and so then this uh, jump carry will make sense. And so the only problem we're left with is uh, is the, the initial run. So when we first initialize the D register, uh, we need to make sure that that carries and set. So a, a very simple way of doing that is, is just test, because test, remember, sets all the flags. So that's our uh, for loop. And so uh, we have our condition. With, uh, Coded, uh, coded that into, no, the conditions here. To coded that simply by this jump carry instruction. We have our increase statement here and we have our uh, initial statement. So all that's left is the, is the body of the function. So what does that do? It calls the is prime function. Okay, so uh, we already know how to call functions. We need to set the address of the function, which is uh, is prime, into the C register. And then we uh, call based on the C register. Uh, so that's that. Uh, now it needs an argument. It needs a candidate. So the candidate has to be in the D register, but fortunately it already is. Um, 
and it will return uh, one or zero. Uh, that's that's what this function does. So it returns in the D register. Of course, by returning into the D register, we're going to lose the value that was there. So once again, we need to save it from the stack before we do that call. And so uh, then our stack will be uh, whatever it was before, and, and plus the value candidate in this case. And so when we've done that, now we basically need to test the D, which, which now no longer contains candidate, but which our is prime function has set to either true or false, uh, meaning one or zero. And uh, so we, we, we'll, we'll just test it to see what the flags are. And so if it's zero, what that means is that the result of this is prime was false. And so we should skip over all of this. And uh, so we'll, we'll just uh, define another label here. Uh, and so we should we should move back to the back to the end of our function. And so in that case, we should jump you know, straight there. Uh, and if it is not zero, then we should uh, execute all of this here. And so at this point, uh, we're going to need that value candidate again, which we put on the stack, so we can go and get it back now. We've uh, done testing the the return value of that function, so so we don't need the D register uh, for that function anymore. So so we can put candidate back in it. And so stack is now once again its initial value, its initial state, and the RD contains the candidate. And uh, then we first of all we need to show the prime. So well, that's uh, really easy. Let's uh, move uh, into the A register, what was in the D register. And secondly, we uh, need to do all of this calculation. And so um, we have a little bit of a problem here because uh, remember we can't use the C register since we'll be accessing data memory. So we can't do this address calculation in the C register. Uh, we could do it in the B register, but we're going to need two registers anyway because this is going to be an addition. Uh, so we'll probably be using B and D to do that. Uh, and so uh, we're once again, we're, we're basically have popped D and then we're going to push it right back again. So it's probably a good idea, since it needs to go in the A register anyway, uh, we'll temporarily use the A register for the value candidate. And, uh, so that means we will have the D register available to, to do our address calculation. And so let's uh, put the value of primes in D. So in, in, in essence, we're doing exactly what we had here. In fact, we can just copy this code and we can do that. Uh, here and then we're going to add uh, so the B register needs to be prime count so we need to load into the B register uh, what's at address location prime count in this way and so then uh, uh, this uh, this will add the two together, so we'll, we'll get the address of, uh, so we get that uh, post increment for a moment. We'll get the value of primes prime count uh, into C. So primes, in this case, prime count will now be in the C register. But of course, we don't really want to load it. We want to write candidate to it. So, so what we want to do is a store to whatever the D register points to of and we stored our candidate in the A register. Very good. Now another slight problem is uh, we've been pushing stuff on the stack again uh, and of course we uh, need to pop it off before we jump back to the beginning of our loop because when we started our loop it, it wasn't on the stack and so we pushed this uh, candidate on the stack um, and we only take it off uh, in the case that uh, in this branch, uh, so where 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 we're in this uh, true section. Uh, and so, if we were to jump straight to five, then it would still be on the stack. So at the moment, we could arrive at this point in two different states, uh, either with the value on the stack or not on the stack. So uh, another way of solving that, rather than doing push and pops uh, in each branch instead of actually popping the value from the stack into the uh, A register, what we can do is, is simply load.
based on the stack pointer. That's a, a sort of a peak operation. Uh, and so when we do that, we, we won't actually change the stack. Uh, RA will still contain the candidate, which we need, but it will additionally remain on the stack. And by doing that, we can then uh, write an actual pop here, and in this case we're going to put it back in the D register because that's where this loop expects it to be. Uh, um, in fact, we need it here because uh, we are increasing the value uh, by two. Um, uh, and that way, uh, this pop will, will occur uh, in all circumstances, and so in this branch, uh, we'll only read it out in, into the A register. So that ought to be our find primes function. Or oh, actually, not quite. Uh, get rid of that warning here. Um, we've uh, forgotten to increase uh, primes. Uh, where are we here? Uh, we, we haven't done that increase. And so we need to, uh, after we've uh, loaded this, uh, this array position with the correct value, we then actually need to increase uh, prime count. Uh, sorry, so the loading into the array uh, is here, and after we do that, um, prime count is still in the B register. We should uh, increase the value by one and uh, store it back into memory. And now we're done. So what that is is uh, prime count plus plus. Uh, can clean up here. And uh, so this function, as you'll notice, uh, uses all of the registers, A, B, C, and D, so they all get clobbered. So it's a good practice to write that here. Something like that. And that leaves us with our uh, main function, which will be, in fact, the uh, entrance, entry point to our program. So main call it well, it'll be void in, in, in this program the uh, main uh, actually won't return it, it'll uh, halt because it's the, the main function um, and so uh, main uh, will be some code and at the end of that code will be a halt so what does main need to do first it needs to just show the number two so to, to you know tell people that we're aware that two is also a prime number uh, and so that's uh, dead simple. In our case, that's just uh, uh, data of two into the A register. And then after that, it needs to call find primes, and that should be the end of it. So to call, we already know how to do that. We uh, put the, f the address of the function in the C register, which is uh, find primes, and uh, we call it. So it would appear that we were able to produce, um, at least theoretically, uh, an assembler version of this C program for our CPU, which is pretty good. So uh, we should uh, try, first of all, uh, if, if, if I haven't written any uh, blatant syntax errors in here, so uh, let's uh, see if I can actually assemble this program. And so I did write an assembler for my CPU a, a while ago, and I'll, uh, I'll put some uh, instructions on, on how to use that uh, in, the, in the description of this video. So, uh, let's uh, invoke the executable and uh, the input will be our primes program. And uh, so we have a problem on line 27. What's uh, going on on line 27? Right, that of course should be data. So we want to move primes to data. Yep. And there we are. So those are the uh, machine code instructions for our CPU uh, corresponding to uh, our assembly program. Now, uh, a few little things I still want to do. So I like to um, put these uh, various functions uh, at well-known locations in memory because uh, it just makes it easier when you're, when you're looking at the program counter. And so we'll put main at, uh, at the top of program memory. And we'll put the find primes uh, at uh, address uh, 32 will be enough. 
that doesn't look. We can see here how long the functions are actually. So that goes from 6 uh, all the way to 35. So yeah, that all fits inside 32 bits. Uh, right, and then we'll have our is prime function at 64. And then is prime is a bit longer. So that's not going to fit in uh, 32 bits. That would, uh, 32 bytes, that would be 67. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll count 64 for, uh, for uh, is prime. And so we'll set the next function, uh, which in fact is the last one, calc remain, we'll set that at uh, 128. There we go, and let's uh, quickly reassemble that. And so there we are. And so now all of our functions uh, should be nicely aligned. So uh, that's the address for calc remain. And uh, our uh, is prime starts nicely on address 64. And the find prime should start nicely on 32 and, uh, and so on. So I guess we can uh, try this out now on our CPU. Oh, actually, uh, not quite yet. There's uh, some some important stuff that we've forgotten. So uh, once again, this is uh, this. Uh, let's have another look at C program. Uh, this is running on a on a bare bones CPU that that doesn't initialize anything at all uh, when it first starts running. Uh, that's entirely up to us. And of course, we didn't. We've simply copied uh, this main function here. But uh, running under an operating system, C programs, uh, of course, do an awful lot of initialization uh, behind the scenes that, that we don't see. First of all, they initialize the stack, which we haven't done, and we need to do that, or we'll get problems. Um, and secondly, we have this uh, global variable here, which we need to initialize. So uh, let's uh, just add some instructions to do that, otherwise uh, we will have problems. So the first thing we want to do is we uh, want to set the stack pointer to zero. By setting it to zero, uh, as soon as it decrements and it starts writing uh, its first value, it will decrement to 255. And so that's how we uh, how we initialize the stack to the top of memory, which uh, seems counterintuitive, but, but that, is, uh, that is the way to do that. So there's a zero in the stack pointer, and we also want a zero in this uh, variable uh, prime count. And of course, prime count is uh, somewhere in data memory, so uh, we need to do a store into uh, prime count, so the address is in, in that symbol here, prime count, and uh, we want to write, uh, well, some register containing zero, and uh, it so happens we've just written zero in the set one, so, so we can do that as a neat little shortcut. So let's just uh, write what we're doing here, to say prime count equal to zero. And then uh, we should be uh, um, in a much better way. So then we start executing here, and we make no assumptions about any of the registers, and uh, yep, that's much better. All right, so let's uh, assemble that. And we did uh, made another mistake. Uh, line seven. Where's my assembly? Line seven. Yes, data. Keep messing those up. There we go. And that is the program which uh, now contains this uh, proper initialization code, which we will uh, load uh, into our CPU. Except that, I think we still have a little problem here in, in this uh, last calculate remainder function because we're not looping. Um, let's, uh, let's call back the C program. Uh, where is it here? Here it is. Um, so our calculate remainder function uh, is, is a huge while loop. And so the while starts at the beginning of the function. And we'd said uh, if the dividend ever gets smaller than the divisor, uh, then um, we should return. But so if it's larger, we jump carry. We do the subtraction. But then, of course, we have to loop back to the beginning. Uh, so we're missing a final jump statement here. Because otherwise our program would simply end on that subtraction and, and then and then start running a, an undetermined code. Of course, uh, we don't want that. So uh, let me just uh, quickly fix that. And so the beginning of the loop is, is in fact the beginning of the function. We, we don't need an extra label for that. Um, there we go. Uh, okay, and so uh, let's assemble that. Yeah, that looks better now. All right, so uh, this is the program we'll uh, load 
uh, onto our CPU. All right, so uh, here is our, uh, our actual home-built CPU. And so we'll try out our program on, on this CPU. So uh, this is the, uh, the assembled program, which we run through the assembler. Um, now, as it turns out, um, there were actually a few errors still in my assembler. So it was generating um, wrong machine codes for a few uh, ALU instructions. Um, and so I fixed the assembler and, and I'll point uh, links and some instructions on, on how to use it and how to use the fixed version, obviously. Uh, but the program itself, the, the assembly language that we wrote together, and which we derived from our original C program, that, that is exactly the, the assembly code that, that we wrote together. And uh, so um, uh, I've then gone ahead and, ins and entered all of this uh, generated machine code into the program memory using all of these dip switches. And as you can see, uh, our program is 134 bytes long. So that took me a good half hour, and, and I'll spare you the video footage of that. because. Uh, so not very interesting, but um, so now the program is uh, in program memory here, and I've uh, reset the program counter with uh, with my reset switch here, um, and so we are we have arrived at the moment of truth, and so uh, we can run this program now and and see if it does what we expect, and so we expect to see prime numbers appearing on this uh, in this A register on this digital display, uh, starting with two. So let's see how well we did in uh, compiling, hand compiling our, our original C program. So uh, let's uh, start it running here. And uh, so it's a pretty slow clock rate, but there's two. That's the, the first prime number, which of course we're writing out uh, manually. But so now he, stood, he should start uh, there. I can see a three, for example. So that, that might be the three, the, the first candidate. Let's uh, speed up the clock a little bit because uh, this is obviously a pretty long program, and uh, if you, uh, if we want to see some results, there's the three actually appearing already, so that, that's a good sign. And uh, so now the the next prime number he's going to try is uh, five. So he's going to try and divide five by all known prime numbers, and so that means three. So uh, there's the AND with 15, remember, we do. And so here's uh, the 3, so he'll probably start subtracting. Yep, and there's 2. And so that's uh, smaller than 3. And so that division didn't didn't work. And uh, that's the only prime number he knows about. So he should have discovered that 5 is a prime number. And so we should see it. Yep, there it is. All right, that's all pretty good. So uh, he should start on the next prime number now, which, uh, which ought to be 7, or the, the next candidate, let's say, should be 7. And so we should start uh, trying to divide 7 by a successive, the already known prime numbers, which are in this case 3 and 5. So he'll uh, start with 3, I imagine, here. And so 7 minus 3 is 4, indeed. And uh, minus 3 is a 1, and so that's, uh, that's not 0, so that's good. And then he just needs to try 5. So that should be appearing. Oh. Yep, there's 5. And so he'll be subtracting 5 from uh, 7, which is 2. And uh, so uh, that also is not 0. And so 7 should uh, should be a hit, should be uh, should appear here in one of the next instructions. Yep, there it is. Let's uh, speed it up a bit more. So the next candidate is 9. And so he should start uh, trying to divide 9 by 3. And of course, uh, this time, that should work. So there's 3. So 9 minus 3 is 6. That's correct. Minus 3 is 3, and minus 3 is 0. And so now he should uh, he should abandon 9, because it's obviously not a prime number. Yep, he has. So that is now 11. So he's, he's going to try 11. That's pretty good. So far... This, uh, this algorithm seems to be working. So uh, he's uh, now trying to divide 11 by 3. So uh, that didn't work, which is good. So he's uh, going to try 5 next. So there's that 11 again. And there's 5. So 11 minus 5 is 6. Minus 5 is a 1, which also is not 0. So that's good. And just needs to try 7. So there's the 11. And there's 7. And so that should result in a 4. And, uh, and that's the end of that. So. So uh, 11 sh should be a winner, should, uh, should appear here. And there it is. Pretty good. So uh, 
just uh, turn it up as much as we can here. So the next one is 13, that, that should be a hit. Yep, and of course 15 isn't, 17 is, 19, 21, no, 23, 25 isn't, nor is 27, 29, that, that's correct. All right, so somewhat unexpected, but uh, well, it, it would seem that, that this, uh, this uh, assembly <laughs> that we wrote, that, that we got it right from, from the first time, which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, I didn't really expect that. But uh, hey, uh, I guess if you think about things properly and, and you, you pay attention, or, or especially if you describe the, your thought process while doing things, uh, I guess they run a bit better. Okay, so is that at maximum speed? There, that's maximum speed. Now, as you can see, this is, this is maximum speed. This computer at the moment is, is running uh, about 500 hertz. And uh, uh, still, it, it, takes, uh, you know, it takes a while to go through all of these uh, subtractions here to these triangles. So there's three, for example. He's trying on some number. I'm not quite sure which one. So uh, five, seven, uh, that was uh, no good. So he's finding a lot of uh, misses here. Okay, that was a good one. Um, but so yeah, this is this uh, this is going to take a while for it to run through uh, all of the possible uh, values, and of course every time we discover a new prime number, uh, the 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 checks get a bit longer because we have an extra number to check, uh, and also as these numbers increase, uh, this division uh, takes longer because uh, we're dividing by subtracting successively, and of course uh, the larger the number, the more the more cycles it takes to to uh, discover the remainder. So it's a pretty slow process. Now, uh, of course, this, this program is in no way uh, optimized. Uh, first of all, we're, we're using a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, functions which we're calling by, by uh, part using the stack, and so that, that involves a, a lot of arithmetic. And uh, so we, we really haven't done any optimization, which, is, which a, a modern compiler certainly would do. None of these functions have been compiled inline, for example. Uh, I imagine that, that this, this is such a small function, this uh, remainder calculation, um, a modern compiler would almost certainly compile that inline. Uh, but of course, uh, there's always time to optimize. Uh, the, the, the good news is that, that we were actually able to produce a working program, even if it's still a bit slow. And of course, uh, with, with a 500 hertz processor, we're, we're never going to get that at, at the, the blazing fast speed that the, the RC program is running on natively uh, on, on my MacBook. But uh, nonetheless, I, I think that's uh, yeah, pretty successful. Now, let me stop it here quickly. Um, another uh, faster way, maybe, to speed up this program. Um, perhaps there's, there's some way we can, we can actually speed up our clock. Because uh, we're using this uh, 555 timer here to, to generate our um, automatic clock signal. And so at the moment, it, it's at maximum speed uh, with this uh, one kilo ohm resistor. And then uh, this is... Uh, uh, a, a one microfarad capacitor uh, and so we're having a, a rising clock edges of, of about uh, um, uh, one millisecond and we're having a falling clock edges of one millisecond so uh, so that's uh, uh, in total that's uh, two milliseconds which corresponds to about 500 hertz but uh, we can replace that uh, one microfarad capacitor uh, with a one nanofarad capacitor and so that should uh, increase our clock speed from uh, 500 hertz to uh, 500 kilohertz. So uh, let's uh, you know not exaggerate too much. So, so let me turn that down a bit, and then and then see if our computer can keep up with uh, the increased speed. Um, so uh, all right, fingers crossed. Let me turn the clock back to automatic mode here. So will he continue? Uh, looks like he's uh, continuing here, pretty much fine, so I think those are still prime numbers. Um, yeah, let's just reset them again, so uh, yep, there he is going through the prime numbers. And so now let's see what happens if we uh, increase the speed here. So yeah, that's uh, definitely running a bit faster, obviously. 
And there we are. We're not even at full speed yet. Boom. And 200, well, we've halted. Yep, because we, uh, we halt at the end of our main routine. So in fact, our program counter should be um, uh, should be nine. Well, it's ten. Yeah, so it's uh, it's increased just past nine. Okay. Wow. Uh, let's try that again at this speed. So uh, yeah, that's the. So let's let's try it at full speed. See what happens. Boom. It's done. It's a matter of seconds. So this computer. Uh, not only is it able to uh, run um, a code here, which we compiled uh, from C code, so its assembly language is, uh, you know, is pretty feature complete if, if it's able to handle a, a proper C program, um, but it can actually run it at 500 kilohertz, and uh, that also is pretty amazing. I know. So uh, let's reset that again. So that looks like a pretty good design, I, I must say. Uh, and so anyway. That pretty much concludes uh, my tour of my homemade CPU, uh, which turned out to be able to do things that uh, <laughs> not even I expected it to be able to do. So uh, here it is running at 500 kilohertz, uh, working out prime numbers uh, in a matter of seconds using this program, which, uh, which we wrote together at the beginning of the episode. So yeah, um, it's been uh, fun uh, working on this and, and talking about it and, and trying to produce uh, useful content for YouTube. So uh, let me know what you thought about, about this video series. And, uh, and uh, as I said in a previous episode, this, if there's any particular um, uh, part of the computer that, that you want some more information on, well, you, you can let me know as well. And, uh, and maybe I'll, uh, I'll try and delve into some, some points which might uh, still not be clear. But uh, other than that, uh, from... Uh, from my perspective, uh, that that pretty much wraps it up. So uh, yeah, thanks for uh, for uh, watching and, and and thanks for subscribing and and, and uh, thank you for commenting. A number of you have been uh, you know very supportive of uh, this initiative, and uh, yeah, I, just, I definitely appreciate that. So enjoy uh, enjoy your time on YouTube and uh, and maybe uh, you'll be working on your own computer uh, in, in the near future and uh, improving uh, even on my design and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing some of those initiatives. So that was uh, that was it for me. So uh, goodbye.